Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I love being with you guys. I love this church. I love Salt and Light. I've been around Salt and Light churches for about 30 years. Uh, so I feel like we're family, and I feel like I'm totally at home here, which is great news. Um, and I'm excited by what God is going to do today. Uh, I have very limited uh, expectations of me, but I have big expectations of God because we serve an amazing God. Yeah. Amazing God. If we just had a smallest glimpse of how incredibly big God is and how amazing is His love for you, then you would, your life would be transformed. You would be liberated to enjoy a level of both fun and fulfillment as well as fruitfulness in your lives. And I'm hoping that I can help everybody allowing God to speak through me, hopefully, to help everybody to take another step on that journey towards freedom, fulfillment, and fruitfulness in your lives. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So thank you for your welcome. Thank you. I always feel slightly nervous when uh, somebody gives, gives me a sort of a rather sort of fulsome uh, introduction because you then have something to live up to. Uh, but I'm just going to be myself, so you'll have to take me as I am. Uh, Love Martin and Linda, love being in their home, love being around their family. You know, what great leaders you've got. Love, love being around Matt and Matt and the worship leaders. And I just came in here for last night's celebration. What an incredible time of praise and worship and sensing God's presence. Who was here last night? Yeah. It, wasn't it fantastic? Yeah. It was absolutely awesome. You know, you're so blessed as a church with all the people that God has brought together. And uh, across this whole movement in the Northeast, all these churches, the incredible leaders that God has appointed, people who are planting, people who are leading, people who are growing, people who are sending others out. I just think you're absolutely amazing. I, I love what you do. I love your hearts. I love all your social action. I love the your 313 project here. I love the fact you're meeting real needs for people and you're seeing people come to faith, people being added to the church. So... Um, you can always tell the, the height of a senior leader by the height of the lectern, um, which doesn't always work for me that well, unfortunately. <laughs> I once went to preach in a, a conference in, in Piraeus in Greece, and uh, I got behind the, the, the pulpit. It was a, a wooden homemade lectern, and I could just about see over the top of it. <laughs> I had to ask them to bring like an orange box for me to stand on. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, it's humbling, isn't it? But there we are. Um, so, yep, I, I'm married. I have a, a gorgeous wife who's very long-suffering. I think I'm her main source of sanctification in life. Um, uh, we've been married nearly 44 years, and I have to say, it gets better. If any of you are finding marriage tough, and there are seasons where marriage is tough, I want to tell you, it gets better. It's worth investing in. It's worth pressing through. It's worth you know, investing in your marriage relationship because it gets better. And I feel more in love with Jenny, my wife now, 44 years on than I you know, have done in the whole of our married life. And it's just such a, a joy to be in those kind of relationships. And you know, for those of you who are single, I know sometimes that's the longing of your heart to be married. Uh, but, you know, God, you know, Jesus and Paul weren't married, and, you know, nobody can say they didn't have fulfilling lives, uh, and singleness is not second rate, singleness is not somehow inferior to marriage, there's loads of positives about being single, um, and whilst I know that many of you will continue to pray for that perfect partner, I want to say make the most of being single, uh, because marriage has its limitations, uh, as well as its joys and blessings. So we have four grown-up daughters. Um, the oldest is, I think, 40 or 41, I've lost track, and the youngest is about 35, I think, somewhere in that sort of range. Four grown-up daughters, eight grandchildren. Uh, three of my daughters uh, married, produced the grandchildren, walking with God in church. One of them's not walking with God, uh, not married, and no children. She is an absolute delight as well. They all live nearby. We get to see loads of them. And uh, it's, you know, we know that she'll come, come to know the Lord, come back to the Lord at some point. It's not a question of if, but when. Uh, and uh, we're just loving being around her all, this, all, the, all these years while she's on her journey. So I started off life, uh, born in Nigeria, uh, lived there for seven years, 
came to the Lord as a 12-year-old through a friend at school inviting me on to a, to a local youth group and then to a summer camp where in a, in a windy, somewhat cold Norfolk field, I knelt down and gave my life to Jesus, not knowing what unbelievable adventures were going to be unleashed over the next 52 years. Uh, I love to think the Christian life is an adventure more than anything else. Anybody else say, say amen to yes? It is an adventure. You know, it's anything but boring. It's anything but boring. It's, you know, as when we learn to follow the Holy Spirit and follow the way God leads us, it's just an amazing adventure. And I hope a few of the little stories I'll tell along the way will uh, highlight that or illustrate that. But uh, if life's not an adventure, then we're living, only living half a life. And uh, the Holy Spirit is able to lead us into some amazing adventures. So I went to Bristol as a medical student, uh, like your esteemed senior pastor here. Uh, did my studies and uh, went into general practice. In fact, I was a GP for uh, 12 years altogether. And during that time, gradually, uh, my love for the church and my passion for the gospel uh, was kind of pushing me more and more towards church leadership until 1991, we were able to go and plant a church in Liverpool, which is, as we all know, the promised land. Okay. Uh, I know you love the Northeast, but Liverpool is the promised land. Uh, we just don't talk about Barcelona. Okay. Um, but uh, it's been a great adventure. You know, we, we moved to Liverpool. I'd never planted a church before. I'd planted congregations and communities and what have you, but I'd never planted a church from scratch before. And so, you know, 12 of us, intrepid explorers, went to the Promised Land. Uh, we crossed our Jordan River, the River Mersey, and came, came, came into the Promised Land, uh, found a few giants that needed conquering, and gradually God established a church around us. And I can only say it was God, because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. It was the grace and mercy of God. And um, I'm so grateful for that, because it's been fun. It's been an exciting adventure. So, where are we heading today? Today is a, is a journey across three sessions, this morning and this afternoon. And uh, I hope, you know, you're not going to miss any because there's a progression from one session to the next that will be really helpful if you can actually be in all three sessions. And I'm trusting that God will speak to you, God will encourage you, God will equip you, and God will send you out from here more confident, and ready for the challenges and the adventures that lie ahead. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So we need two ears open today. You need one ear open to listen to me, but you need the other ear open to listen to the Holy Spirit because we're going to do a little experiment today. And uh, you'll have sheets um, given out to you which uh, have got three boxes in. They're boxes for each of the sessions. And you'll see in those boxes that there's two questions I'm asking you to answer about each of today's sessions. And those um, questions are, firstly, what's God saying to you? Because, you know, who believes that God's speaking all the time? You know, we're just a bit dull of hearing, aren't we? We're a bit, you know, sh short on the hearing side sometimes. And perhaps that's because we're not listening. But I think God is always trying to speak to us, always trying to get our attention. And I hope there'll be a, just a few light bulb moments today. You think, yeah, I need to remember that. What we, what we would call a kairos moment, one of those kind of moments in time when God's breaking in. You know, Mark 1.15 says that the time, kairos, is now. It's that moment in time, not the chronos, the Greek word for the, you know, the passage of time that unfolds gradually, but the kairos moment when God breaks in. He says, the time is now, Mark 1.15. The kingdom of heaven is at Hand. In other words, heaven is trying to break in right now. It's poised and ready to break into your life through this Kairos moment. And our response is to repent, to change the way we think, to see things differently, to turn away from you know, living for ourselves, to turn towards living for God, but to turn away from just you know, going our own way to actually focusing on what God is saying to me right now. Our response is to repent, to turn towards God's word to us and to start to live that out. And the second question is, what am I going to do about it? Repent and believe. That word believe in Mark 1.15 is a powerful, active, this is how I'm going to step out in faith word. The word for faith in the Greek is the same as the word for believe. It's pistis, pisteo. 
And it's an active word. It's not an intellectual, yes, I agree with that intellectually belief. No, it's a belief that says, yeah, God's spoken to me. This is what I'm going to do by faith. I'm going to take a step of faith. It's an active word. It's a stepping out into what God has told me to do. So the time is now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we're going to repent and believe. We're going to say, what's God saying to me? How do I need to change my thinking? And how am I going to step out in faith? How am I going to repent and believe? And that's what these sheets are for, to help you keep track through the day of just one thing from each of the sessions that you think God is getting your attention in. So it's a little bit different to maybe how you've, how you've, uh, what, you, what you might have expected of today. Uh, but what I'm praying is that through the sessions, as God gets your attention, if it's something that is personal to you, it'll be different to the person who's next to you. You're going to write that down at the end of the session. We're going to have a little pause, a moment to reflect and just listen out of all the words that you've heard. What is it that God's actually saying to me? What's God's word to me? Because, you know, when God speaks, everything changes. Everything changes. And following, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, Deuteronomy 8, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know, are we as hungry for the words of God as we are for our daily bread? So we are for that, you know, freshly baked loaf that we, we get from the local artisan baker or that fantastic, you know, Mother's Prize stuff we get from Asda, you know, toasted and jammed and buttered in the mornings. Are we as hungry for God's word as we are for our daily bread? Do we have an expectation that every day we're going to get fed? by God speaking to us, because that's what Deuteronomy says. We're not to live by bread alone. We're not to live by natural means, and that includes all of our natural resources. We're not just to live by natural means, but by supernatural sustenance, which comes when God speaks to us, because when God speaks, everything changes. Nothing remains the same. So I'm praying that God will speak to us. Father, would you speak to us today by your Holy Spirit? Would you grab our attention today, Lord? May there be words in each of these sessions that we're able to hear from heaven, the kingdom of heaven breaking in at hand so that we can repent and change the way we think and act in faith and respond to your word. So I call these questions, we, we use them in all the churches that I'm working with, we use these two questions all the time. It's the absolute bedrock of what we call discipleship culture. You know, culture is just how we do things around here. That's the way Sam Chan defines it. And how we do things around here in all of the churches that we work with, it's based on these two simplest of questions. What's God saying to me? What am I going to do about it? Do you know, if you start to live out of those two questions each day of your life, you will never have a boring day. You will be led on all sorts of amazing adventures. You will find yourselves high and dry except for the grace of God gets you through, you will find yourselves in the times of the most amazing God moments where he breaks in. You will discover all sorts of things that you'd never see if you just live by the daily bread, your natural resources. We need to live by every word that comes from God's mouth. So in each of these sessions, I'm going to pause at the end. I'm going to give you a moment just to listen to the Holy Spirit because he's always speaking to us. And he'll bring something to mind you know, 90% 90, 90 of the time we hear something when we ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And then you're going to ask the second question is, what do you want me to do about it? And you're going to write the answer to those two questions. And at the end of the day, there's a box at the bottom on the sheet which allows you to enter those three things that you're going to do, and that's your personal development plan. Okay, each of you are going to leave here, I'm believing, with a personal development plan. And at the very bottom, there's a space where you can write, who am I going to be accountable to for actually doing the things that God's told me to do? Who knows that accountability makes everything work better? And, uh, you know, have you ever started one of those diets, but you never told anybody? You know, I'm going to lose weight, but I'm not telling anybody. How long did that last? Yeah, about two days. Okay. But, you know, you log on to Weight Watchers or you tell your best friend or you, you, know, you tell your husband and wife, you know, I'm, I'm determined to lose some weight, love. You know, please don't let me, you know, go for the biscuit barrel or whatever it is, a uh, little, you know, little temptation. And once we've said it, once we've declared it, once we've held ourselves accountable, you know, you're 10 times more likely to actually see it through and to get the benefits of it. Because that's, 
you know, what we're about today is we want fruitful lives, don't we? We want lives that are fulfilled, and we want lives that are fruitful, because that's the best way to live. It's the, it's the most exciting way to live. It's the most wonderful way to live. So that's what we're going to do at the end of each session. Um, so as Martin said, I, I led Frontline Church with my co-pastor uh, for 24 years, uh, and uh, somehow we managed to avoid killing each other, which is a small miracle. Uh, it's a bit, it was a bit like being married. You know, the, the things that attract you to someone in the early days of marriage are the things that drive you crazy within two years. Um, and for me and my co-pastor, it was, it was, it's funny, I was a doctor, he was a nurse, and it was kind of love at first sight, you know. It really was. Uh, it was a real bromance. And, uh, you know, we couldn't see enough of each other in those first few weeks. And as we had this sense, God wanted us to work together and called us into a shared ministry, which was a huge joy, as well as a great challenge. But, the, you know, the things that attracted me to Dave and Dave to me, I'm absolutely sure, I know, drove us both crazy over the years. But by the grace of God, we managed to stay working together for 24 years, and I'm sure what God did was partly as a result of that, and not by any great gift of ourselves. Just the fact we had a relationship that stood the test of time. Um, but four years ago, uh, we had the joy of handing the church on, uh, and to a younger leader called John Harding, who's actually from Yorkshire, uh, so in no relation to me. Uh, as soon as he opens his mouth, people can tell he's not my son. Um, and uh, he's doing a fantastic job with the church, and I, I am so delighted. I have no responsibilities in the local church except a little bit of coaching here and there. Um, I'm not on the leadership team, not on the trustee board. I have no idea what's going to happen next. I find out as much as anybody else does from the, the, the weekly e-shots and the app, etc., but he's doing a fantastic job. Since then, I've been able to work with churches around the UK uh, that are really trying to put uh, mission and discipleship at the heart of church life. And uh, it's an organization called Kairos Connection. Kairos, that moment when God breaks in connection because we're all connecting with, e with God and with each other around the things that God is saying to us, particularly around mission and discipleship. How do we learn to build churches that have mission and discipleship front and center of church life that become the engine of how churches are growing and driving forward and taking ground, taking ground from the enemy, taking kingdom ground for God? Mission and discipleship, I believe, however our churches are organized and structured, need to be at the very heart of church life. One of the reasons, in fact, that um, Jenny and I and our team of 12 moved from Bristol to Liverpool was to plant a church where mission was the very front end, the sharp end, if you like, of the arrow or the snowplow, whatever you want to call it, that would actually see the church move forward and take ground. So that's, uh, that's my four-day-a-week job, and uh, my one-day-a-week job is a local regional job uh, with uh, uh, directing Together for the Harvest, which is, has a slightly ambitious goal of seeing every man, woman, and child reached with the gospel in the Liverpool city region, that's 1.5 million people, in a 10-year time frame. So uh, I think we need a big God, don't we? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a completely impossible goal. And uh, we, may never, we may never achieve it, but we're going to have a good go yeah. because we serve a big God. Right. And God is able to do incredible things. So that's how I spend my time these days. Uh, I'm still involved in Frontline Church. Still rock up on a Sunday. Love being there. They're my family. Why would I ever want to be anywhere else? You know, they are. My friends and family are all there. So, how great is our God? How great is our God? How great is our God? It's an exclamation. It's a declaration. It's a confession. How great is our God? And it's a good one to make. But it's also a question. How great is our God? How great is your God? How great is my God? Is it really a big enough vision of God? Is it really a big enough vision of God? And I'm hoping that uh, across these sessions today, we will begin to discover just how great God is. Because when we discover how great God is, do you know that you and I are made in his image? Have you ever thought about that? When we truly know God for who he is, we will discover our true potential 
in the light of who God is. So if I don't believe God is big enough to rule the universe and to have all things under his power, then I'm going to panic when some small thing happens in my life that I feel I'm out of control of. Is that right? But if I have this vision of God who is great and able to do absolutely anything, I look at my small problem, I thought, well, that's no problem to God. I may not know the answer, but he certainly does. You see, when we have a big enough vision of God, life takes on a different reflection. We see life through a different lens. J.B. Phillips, the author and translator of some of the Bible, a great translation of the New Testament if you've never come across it. He wrote a book, uh, it's a classic Christian book 40 years ago, called Your God is Too Small. You know, I think for some of us, our God is too small. Our God is too small, and because our God is too small, we have a small view of ourselves. We have a limited view of us because we don't see God as he is, and then we have a very limited view of how God might use us rather than believing that anything is possible. Let's read this scripture together. Ephesians 3, this is the, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of different translations, so if you're trying to follow it, you'll have difficulty. It's a combination of several translations to try and fill out the real meaning of this verse. So, now to God, it's a good starting point. Now to God who is able to do immeasurably more, say immeasurably more, immeasurably. exceeding abundantly, say exceeding abundantly. Super abundantly. Say super abundantly. Infinitely more. Infinitely. Are, are you getting the idea? This is our God. Infinitely more than we can ask, think, or imagine. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. To Him be glory in the church. Not to some small limited view of God, but to this God. Yeah be glory in the church now and forever through all generations, through all generations. You know, one of the greatest blessings that we can give our children and their children is a great view of God to all generations, passing down this, this God for whom nothing is impossible. All things are possible. It's an, he's an amazing God. So 2008, January 2008, uh, is the culmination of one of the greatest acts of folly I have ever done in my life. It's, uh, I'm so embarrassed at the fact that this, I, was, I was steering the ship when this happened. Uh, I was probably not having a big enough view of I certainly wasn't having a big enough view of God. And I was thinking that maybe I need to help God out, provide for my future. Ever felt like that? Maybe I need to help God out because not, I'm not quite confident he's going to deliver for me, not going to be big enough for me, not going to be faithful enough for me, not going to be loving enough for me, not going to be a big enough, a able enough provider for me. So I thought, well, you know, pension pot's about this big and, you know, who knows how long the future will be. Uh, let's help God out. Let's, let's invest in some property, uh, you know, and see whether we can help the pension pot grow a bit. And so you know, there was a about 18 months of uh, two years of investing in this property before it was built. So the idea was the property gets built, the Spanish property market is sort of going through the roof and uh, everyone's saying it's a great investment, you know, even before it's built you'll sell it on and you'll make this much money and it all sounded very good. By the way, if anything sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true, okay, yeah. So just a little word of warning from the, uh, the, the twice bitten. So we, we invested in some property, four properties actually, uh, and uh, as the time for completion got nearer, started to get a bit nervous because the Spanish property bubble was starting to, to pop and you know, the, they, they weren't increasing in value as they were and the people who'd sold on earlier, you know, people weren't getting the same returns on their, on their investment. Um, and then of course, we had the world economic crash. So as well as the Spanish property bubble bursting, the world banking disaster took place and absolutely nothing was selling. So we get to January 2008 and four properties uh, 
we are said, you know, you, you're going to have to complete on these properties. Well, we didn't have the money to complete on them. The idea was you'd sell them on before they completed. You know, we'd mortgaged ourselves up to the eyeballs. We'd got several other loans and to invest in these properties. It's another bad move, by the way. And suddenly, January 2008, two of the properties are going to be completed, and we have to pay the balance. Thankfully, the other two weren't ready yet. So I'm just, oh, God. You know, I was feeling absolutely terrible, feeling distraught. I was feeling like I've let Jenny down. I've let our family down. I've let myself down. I've let God down. And, uh, and somehow, that moment you know, was kind of one of those panic moments. I think I nearly lost it at that point. I told we were, Jenny and I were driving along, and Jenny all this time said, you are going to sort this out, Nick. This isn't going to happen, is it? You know, and, and I sort of blustered, no, no, it'll be fine, Jenny, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And the day came, and the day of reckoning came, and I had to say, Jenny, I'm sorry, love. We are going to have to just somehow find this extra money from somewhere. I don't know where from. We put 40% down. We had to find another 60% to complete on those two properties. And somehow, by the grace of God, we managed to raise enough loans. And the grace of God, in the first phone call I make, said, Chris, a good friend of mine, I said, Chris, just need you to, he's a financial wizard. And I said, I need your advice. What do we do? He said, Nick, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to write you a check for £10,000. It's a gift to you. Wow. Okay, well, that was a little encouraging. <laughs> but then we had to find all the other money, extra loans and you know, bigger mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. And for 18 months, we lived in this zone where if the other two properties completed, we would definitely have gone bankrupt. There was no way we could raise the extra money. But in that period of time, God began to speak to me. Uh, you can imagine I was kind of keen to hear from God at that moment. <laughs> and sometimes it's not till everything goes wrong and we find, oh, yeah, I haven't prayed about this, have I? Uh, you know, how dumb can we be and still breathe? And, and I, I, you know, I was just, I was every day, I was down in my cellar. I was crying out to God. God, I've made such a mess of this. What am I going to do? I've nearly bankrupted us. And, you know, it really was literally, if I didn't have a word from God every day, I was, that was a terrible day. I needed a fresh, it just totally underlined that scripture of, you know, man living by, not by bread alone, but every word, a daily word from God. And those words sustained me through that period of time. But during that period of time, God also, I sensed, and it was more than a, a vague sense, it was a strong sense that God gave me a word about how it was going to pan out. And I felt like God say, Nick, this is going to be a 10-year journey. Can you imagine that was not what I wanted to hear from God? <laughs> I wanted God to say, yeah, we'll fix this within six months, Nick. Don't worry. I'll, you know, there'll be a check come through the door or you know, I'll provide for you miraculously, etc., etc. Ten years. I told Jenny that's what I thought God had said, and she nearly killed me. I said, no, you said you'd fix this. You said you'd fix this. But you know, I want to say God is able to do far more abundantly than we could ask think, imagine, more than we dared, hoped, or dreamed. They were a chastening 10 years. You know, I was humbled by that experience. You know, church leader nearly goes bankrupt. Doesn't make good headlines, does it? I was honest with my friends. It was my friends, my other pastors who stood with me in that time that just helped me get through those moments. The 18 months, the other properties were due to complete, and we finally got the, the word that they were not going to be built. The builder had gone bust, and our, our deposits were being returned. Whew, suddenly, a little bit of the pressure lifts off because we've now got a bit of more money to, to deal with some of our, our debts. But over that 10-year period, God, little by little, there was no miraculous moment where he canceled it all, but just you know, paying off this bit and that bit, clearing this mortgage, that loan, personal loans as well as bank loans. So 10 years on, January 2000, sorry, 2018, 10 years to the month, we finally sell the second Spanish property and our debts are completely cleared. Wow. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
I will promise, Lord, I will never do that again. <laughs> you know, you don't make those mistakes in life twice, do you? But, you know, God would say, I just thought there's no way we can, you know, I was literally at one point, we were half a million pounds in personal debt. That's how ridiculous it was. That's how stupid I was. Totally ridiculous. But this is the truth, that God is able to do immeasurably more, more exceeding abundantly, super abundantly, infinitely more than we can ask, think, or imagine. I'm glad we serve a God like that. I'm glad that you know, God said, it's a 10-year journey, Nick, but I'm with you. Trust me. And so we did. Along the way, we just tried to follow what the Holy Spirit was telling us to do day by day, week by week. I don't think I bought a, a piece of clothing for at least two years. You know, there was, it was a restrictive time, but it was an important time of learning for me. Put a whole new value on money, a whole new value on material things. You know, God began to break some of the power of mammon in my life through that experience. But God is good. God is, I don't know what you're going through right now, what situation you're facing that feels like it's an impossibility. I know there'll be, you know, probably 20% of this room right now will be having a situation that they feel it's impossible. You don't know how to get out of it. You don't know what to do about it. I want to tell you, God is able. Can you say amen to that? On a slightly more positive note, some years ago, um, I was driving down the high street, recognized I needed a little bit more fuel in the car. So I pulled into a uh, petrol station, filled up, went in to pay, and this little um, Asian-looking guy is behind the, 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 uh, the till. And um, I think I must have had a, blush, a rush of blood to the head or something. You know, I, I hadn't thought this through at all. But I just kind of blurted out to him. I said, uh, uh, do you know Jesus? I mean, you know, it's not, not really well thought through opening statement, is it? You know, it's not like a subtle approach to kind of sharing the gospel with someone. I just said, do you know Jesus? And he said, no. And I couldn't think of a single thing to say. <laughs> My mind went completely blank. So you do what you do in those moments. You pay for your petrol and you get out as fast as you can. <laughs> You know, I'm so thankful my God is not limited by my stupidity or my ignorance or my, or my personal limitations. I went back a week later and I thought, oh, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, you know. Nothing to lose now. I've totally embarrassed myself. I might as well finish the job off. So I paid for my petrol. And I said, uh, again, a, a very sort of, you know, unthought through opening line. I just said, would you like to come to church, you know? And to my surprise, he didn't just say no. He just said, uh, just a moment. And he, he went behind the screen that you know, was just next to him. And I heard him talking to somebody, a female in, a, in a, another language I didn't understand. It later turned out to be Tamil. And uh, he came back with his wife. And they both looked at me and they said, yes, we would like to come to church. <laughs> well, he could have knocked me down with a feather. Um, not only did they say yes, they actually turned up. You know, how often does that not happen, okay? You know, they say yes, but they never show, and which is a good reason to always offer to pick them up, to meet them somewhere, even if it's on the door, because it is a terrifying experience if you've never been to church to walk in on your own, knowing nobody. Please offer to pick them up when you invite them to church. They turned up, and we chatted with them after the service, discovered actually the reason they'd come is because they had some marriage difficulties and they thought maybe they'd get some help. Um, and so we started to meet up with them in their home and uh, started to share the gospel with them. And uh, both of them came to the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? They came to the Lord. But you know, it didn't end there. We discovered that the wife, whose name was Rita, both Sri Lankan, Tamil-speaking Sri Lankans, uh, had an auntie in London and this auntie in London was a thoroughly born-again Pentecostal Christian who had been praying for Rita for years. Now, nah, how often do we find that? Praying for her for years. And uh, this is quite a you know, it's a large church in London, Tamil-speaking church. Uh, and as soon as they heard that Rita and her husband Jude had become Christians, 
they, uh, they said, why don't we send someone up to help and encourage them? And so every week, one or two people came up from that church, met with this couple in their home, and said, have you got friends you'd like, other Tamil-speaking friends you'd like to invite? And so they invited their friends, and other people came to know Jesus, and a flipping church was born, a, a Tamil-speaking church that I had nothing to do with. I mean, how great is our God? In my, in my folly and stupidity, somehow God, God is bigger. He's more able. And they met in our church for six months before they moved into a, a different facility. How great is our God? And I'm so glad it doesn't depend on us. Is that, is that truth? I'm so glad it doesn't depend on us. It depends on our God. You know, God doesn't require you to have any great abilities. In fact, actually, there's only two abilities that God really wants of you. It's availability and accountability. If you will make yourself available to God, and if in what He calls you to do, you will find someone, another person, maybe your small group or some friends or your family, and make yourself accountable for what you feel God's telling you to do. In that moment of availability and accountability, God will do miraculous things. It doesn't depend on us. It does depend on God. The thing about availability, of course, is when you're available to the Holy Spirit, life sometimes gets complicated. Anybody discovered that when you're trying to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit, it's not always convenient? Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't often work. He doesn't, he doesn't seem to check my diary before he pushes me in a certain direction to do something. But inconvenience is a small price to pay for the joy of watching God work through our lives. So let me just um, spend a few moments thinking about what God is actually like. What is he like? We have a little shorthand thing that we often use in our church and other churches, which is called the four G's. It's four G's uh, that describe what God is like. And, you know, there's plenty of other words we could use to describe God, but these just are a shorthand way of memorizing, reflecting, and able to call to mind who is this God who is able to do it exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ask, think, or imagine. So here's a little summary of those four G's. comes from Tim Chester in his book called You Can Change. Uh, we've just been using these for years now. They've been so helpful. God is great, glorious, good, and gracious. I'm going to unpack these one at a time uh, in a moment. But as we start to get a bigger view of God, we will also start to understand what is now true of me in the light of who he is. And that's a key next step where we're going to, you'll see we're going to go there in a moment. When I understand what God is like, I then ask the question, so if that's what God is like, what is true about me in the light of who God is? Because I'm made in his image. I receive the benefits and blessings of who this God is in my life. What is now true of me? It will help us to develop our full potential as children of God. So let's, let's go to the first one. God is great, and there are many things that are true because God is great, but one of them is, so I don't have to be in control. Anybody else like me, a bit of a control freak, neat freak, like everything in order in your life? You know, I find it very hard to work on a messy desk. All my pencils are lined up in a little tray. You know, my shoes are all in line in the cupboard. And, uh, you know, if I had the time, all of my books on my bookshelves would be alphabetically arranged. Sadly, they don't never quite get there. It's my little dream. And so for someone who likes to be in control, I have to remind myself frequently, I don't need to be in control because God is great. It's so simple, isn't it? And how often do I try and control my life? In fact, we all try to do this at times. We try to control our lives. We, and worse still, we try and control other people. You know, if, you've got a, if you're a bit of a controller, you'll probably try and do that with your husband or your wife or your best friends or where you work. You know, try and, being controlled by someone else is not nice, is it? It's not good. But I don't need to be in control if God is great. 
I don't need to make sure everything is understood and explained and in order. In, you know, God creates in chaos. You know, the earth was formless and void, and God spoke into being. In the chaos, God speaks, and in His great power, brings something unbelievable into being. And we sometimes just need to live with that disorder, that chaos, that not being in control. I've only ever had one panic attack in my life, and I'm, I, I never want to have it again because it was horrible. And if you've ever suffered with panic attacks, you know, if you've never suffered with them, you just want to say, pull yourself together. When you have suffered with one, you realize it is completely out of your control, and it's a horrible experience. So I woke up in the morning, and uh, I had a breakfast meeting with somebody. It was a busy day, and had the, I met them for breakfast and went on to the office. And as I got into the office and started to work, I thought, something's not quite right here. Something's, I don't feel quite normal. And as the day went on, I began to realize, actually, I don't quite know what I'm doing. I feel slightly out of control. I feel like I'm almost out of my body looking down on it. This is weird. And I can't actually remember what I said or did 10 minutes ago. And my mind was confused, and I, I couldn't quite figure out, you know, is this early onset dementia? I mean, you know, what's going on here, Lord? And it was a horrible, horrible feeling. And uh, somehow I got through the day. But that night I had to go and speak at a, a church in our area. And I just didn't know if I could do it. I mean, you know, I could physically stand up, but my mind was just all over the place. I said to Jenny, Jenny, you're going to have to come with me. You know, I don't know if I'm going to get through tonight. And if I, if I just dry up after five or ten minutes, would you step in and just take over? Just say something. It doesn't really matter what you say. Say something. Um, she, she's actually a much better speaker than I am. And... Uh, she said, yeah, I'll come with you. So she came with me, and we, we uh, you know, got up and somehow got through the evening and collapsed into bed that night. I thought, oh, God, what if this is, how long is this going to last for? Is this going to be days, weeks, months, or is this the rest of my life, Lord? You know, it's that not knowing, isn't it? Not knowing is scary. And I woke up the next morning, and miraculously and marvelously and wonderfully, I was back to normal. Do you think God was trying to get my attention? He absolutely was. It was a major Kairos moment in my life. And God began to speak to me about all sorts of things in my life that needed to be uh, rearranged. Some of it was practical, but some of it was what was happening up here in my, in my head. And a lot of it was around needing to be in control. And that the effort and the energy of trying to control so many moving parts finally flipped a switch in my head and went into this panic attack mode. And I'm just so thankful to God. I've never experienced one since. But it was a real word of warning. You know, Nick, if you don't sort this out, you know, your mental health is going to go downhill rapidly. And I had to let go of control. I had to start trusting God at a deeper level. And my confession was, God, you are great. Nothing is too difficult for you. I do not need to be in control. And for weeks, that was my daily confession, my hourly confession at times, when thoughts and fears would start to crowd in on my brain again. And do you know what? Even if you thought you were in control at any point in your life, it's a complete illusion. <laughs> it's a total illusion. We're never in control. You never know what's going to come around the corner. Control is futile. Somebody once said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Okay. <laughs> we have a God who is great and able to be in control. He is the only God of the universe. I don't have to play second fiddle to God and be his assistant controlling the universe. I just have to trust him. God is great. I don't need to be in control. 20 past 11, you said, Martin. Okay, we're in big trouble, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Will. I am not in control. Yeah, your coffee may be cold when you get to it, but, you know, hey, God's in control. <laughs> we have a God who is great and able to be in control. He works, do you know what? He works all things together for good. All things. Everything. Just say all things. 
He works all things. Now, there are a couple of little things around that verse I just want to point out to you. It's for those who, are, those who love him. Okay, so you, and we're going to dip into this in the next session. What does it mean to truly love God? For those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, we're going to dip into that in the third session, so tighten your seatbelts. Um, and it's pre- preceded by those verses where it says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't have to pray as we should, but the Spirit prays through us with groanings too deep for words, and he who knows the mind of the Spirit is able to hear and respond to those prayers. So I think you know when we're sandwiched by the the prayers of the Holy Spirit being prayed through us and the love of God and the purpose of God surrounding us and underpinning our lives, we can truly say all things work together for good. The prayers are bringing God's purpose into being. The love just positions us and aligns us for the blessing of God on our lives. All things work together for good. And when something unexpected happens, let me offer you a little gift This is a free one, okay. Uh, When something unexpected happens that kind of disturbs your equilibrium or frustrates your plans or doesn't work out as you expected, instead of saying, oh, how frustrating, here's my gift to you. You ready? It's worth writing down this one, okay. Instead of saying, how frustrating, say, how fascinating. (laughs) That simple change of mindset opens up what I call infinite generative possibilities of what God might do in the unexpected. Don't say how frustrating, say how fascinating. I wonder what God's up to here. And then you start to think, what are you doing here, Lord? And you start to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, and God, in His wisdom, works all things together good. Imagine the joy in your life. And we're going to talk more about joy on Sunday morning. I'm excited about that message. Um, Imagine the joy in your life if you were completely free from worry and anxiety and all fear. Wouldn't that be amazing? Just think how life would be. It would be revolutionized for most of us. We can live like that. Because God has demonstrated in Scripture, in our lives, and at the cross, just how great he is. We don't need to be in control. Now, I'm going to just run through these other three G's of God uh, so that you get the idea. You're going to need to do some digging in, uh, but I want to just give you the headlines. So here we go. That's the scripture we read. God is glorious, so we don't have to fear others. Because when we see God in his glory and his beauty and his majesty and his splendor, and we think, oh God, how do, how do I get to have a relationship with you? This is unbelievable that you, the creator of all things, in all of your majesty and splendor, I am in a relationship with you. Do you know what? That awesome reverence and respect for the almighty God, which the scripture calls the fear of the Lord, It leads to two things. One is the only fear there is room for in your life is the fear of the Lord, so you don't fear anybody. But also the only one you want to please in your life is Him. And so what other people think of you, you know, you're living for this audience of one. It's His pleasure, His approval that you're looking for. It's His delight that you delight in. And what other people think of you, yeah, yeah, maybe, you know, I'll take note, but, you know, I'm really not interested. I'm really only interested in pleasing him because I live in the fear of this glorious God who I love and want to please with all my heart. I tell you, for me, it has been a major revelation in being fearless in sharing my faith. Now, I am a natural, I'm naturally a shy introvert. That is my personality. I'm a shy introvert. So for me, to share my faith with a stranger, let alone a friend, has always been a big challenge. But as I began to see this is the God that I worship, that I serve, that I love, that I want to please, why would I not? Why would I be concerned about the potential rejection of sharing my faith with someone, their opinion or their approval or looking good in their eyes when actually I'm living to please Him? It's revolutionized. I will 
share some of that stuff later. Imagine never fearing what your boss at work was going to say. Imagine never being afraid of, of your parents' wrath. Imagine if you never bothered what your social media contacts said or never got any likes on your Facebook page. Just imagine being completely liberated from any of that rubbish. You can live free when you understand who God is. Paul said this to the Corinthians, I make it my ambition to be pleasing to God. Not because I fear His wrath or I'm trying to earn His approval. I want to be pleasing to Him because He delights in me. And I delight in Him. There's nothing more that I want to... You know, when you first fall in love with someone, you know, anybody ever fell in love with somebody? Remember the first time you thought nothing of doing anything you could to please them? You know, my wife loved fries, cream, chocolate when we were first married. I don't know if it still exists today. You know, it does. Okay, some of you still love it. Um, you know, it didn't... It was not the slightest hesitation. I wanted to please her, so I would go and get her a fry ice cream chocolate. My wife loves cut flowers. I think, why buy cut flowers? They're going to die. You know? <laughs> you know, to a man, you know, that's logical. That's much more sensible to buy a plant that's going to grow. But she loves cut flowers. I don't, think, I don't think this is a wasted fiver in Tesco's to buy her a bunch of roses. I just think, I want to please her. Yeah. And I, you know, I will do that all the time because I want to please her because I love her. And having an ambition to be pleasing to God is not trying to earn anything. It's just a, res a love response to the one who delights in us. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So Martin says I can go through till 12 o'clock. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What are friends for? <laughs> so we need to be meditating and reflecting on scriptures that help us understand what God is like. His greatness, His glory. We need to be confessing those scriptures. We need to be worshipping Him around those attributes of His character and His nature. We need to be deeply connecting to who our God is. Again, more on that in the next session. But this is the way that we grow in our appreciation of the nature of our God and how this can transform our lives and the way we live for Him. How has God demonstrated His glory? Let's look in Scripture Let's look in our lives and reflect on our experience. Let's look at the cross. Always look in those three areas, in Scripture, in our lives, and at the cross, to understand some of these aspects of God's nature. Number three, God is good. I love this one. God is good, so we don't have to look elsewhere. We don't have to look elsewhere for comfort or satisfaction. Most of us have a little stress bolt hole. When we're feeling stressed, we think, actually, I just need a little bit of chocolate. Or I just need another episode of Line of Duty. By the way, is Hastings H? <laughs> Can we take a quick poll on that? How many people think Hastings is H? Yeah. How many people think Hastings definitely not H? Yeah, okay. How many people think we're still not going to find out on Sunday night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a little bolt holes that we go to for our comfort. You know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with line of duty. I'm loving it as much as anybody. But, you know, where do we go to in our moments of stress for comfort? Where do we look for our satisfaction in life? There's all this other stuff out there, and God gives much of it for our own pleasure because he loves to bless his children. But if that's our immediate default, if, we, if our satisfaction is in whether we've got the latest car or whether we've got uh, a wider screen TV or whether we've got um, more likes on Facebook or you know, whatever it is that brings us that little bit of personal comfort and satisfaction, let's go back to the goodness of God. God is 
good, not just a little bit good. He's infinitely and ultimately good. Love is his nature. If you cut God through like a sticker rock, love will be all the way through. You cannot run away from the love of God or his goodness towards you. I love this scripture in 1 Timothy 6. It talks about God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. It's from God. Where do we look to for our satisfaction in life? Is it from God or is it elsewhere? Because some of those things, those appetites that we have for other things can sometimes border on addictions. You know, and some of it we know is unhealthy. You know, sometimes alcohol or pornography or, you know, whatever it might be that, you know, become addictive in our lives, we need to stand well clear of. Romans 1.25 says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. Where do we go to for our satisfaction? Where do we go? I, I love the fact that uh, having lived long enough and invested in enough people's lives, I find wherever I go, I find people just want to bless me. It's just great. Or there's, you know, I probably have a home in pretty much any town or city I want to go to. It's a huge blessing. The blessing of having invested in so many lives over the years. It's a, it's a great privilege. There was one summer when, um, I don't know why, I think another one of those rush of blood to the head things. I just, in my prayer time, I, it was, I think we were in a sort of particularly sunny spell. And uh, this prayer sort of came out of me. I don't know quite where it came from. But the prayer was, God, I'd love an open-top sports car. <laughs> it wasn't contrived. It wasn't like, you know, you're a bad God if you don't do it. But I'd love an open-top. And I didn't think any more about it. But uh, a, a week or two later, we were on the island of Jersey and working with a church there. And the, um, the pastor and his wife uh, had us to stay with them. And suddenly the, the wife had to go to the mainland because her daughter was having a baby. And... Um, you know, she said, oh, by the way, Nick, uh, I'm going to be away for the rest of this week. And while you're here, I know you've got a few days free. Would you like to take my car? Guess what? It was a soft top Mazda. And for five days, we had the joy of cruising around these beautiful country lanes, these beautiful beaches, these gorgeous beauty spots in an open top sports car. I thought, God, you're unreal. You heard that prayer. I didn't even think you heard that one. Okay, he didn't give me one to own. That's probably a good, you know, his love as well. Um, but I got, to, I got to play with one for five days. God is good. He richly gives us everything to enjoy. And finally, God is gracious. We don't have to prove ourselves. We don't have to earn God's favor. You know, Jesus at the Jordan River, before he's ever done any work for the kingdom, before he's ever healed a sick man, cleansed a leper, raised a dead person, preached the gospel. Do you know what the Father's word to him is at that moment? It says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He hadn't done anything to earn that approval, that affirmation, simply because he was his Son. And because you are his Son or his daughter today, he says over your life, whether you feel you failed God, whether you feel you are living full on for Him, whether you've just recently come become a, a follower of Jesus, or whether you've been one all of your life, God says to you today, you are my beloved child, and in you I am well pleased. Can you just say that to the person next to you? You are my beloved child, in you I am well pleased. And I just want you to imagine that's God speaking to you because it's true. We do not have to prove. We don't have to, all that effort of striving to earn God's favor because God is gracious. I love spending time with God, and we're going to look at this a little bit more in the next session. 
And one of the things I constantly rehearse with God, when I, when I spend time with God, I remind myself of these four Gs regularly. I say, God is so good. You're so great. I love you. And it's so wonderful. You're in control of my life. I don't have to worry about this appointment that's coming up later in the day. And I'm a bit, you know, I could be a bit anxious about it, but it's going to be fine because you're in control. Or I thank you, Lord God, that, you know, whether, you know, this training event goes well or, you know, these folks in Teesside like me or not, you know, I thank you that I have your approval. You know, what more could I need? You know, they can boo me off the stage if they want to. I'm still loved by you. I'm loved by you. I'm approved by you. You say you are pleased with me. What more could I need? God is gracious. I don't need to earn his approval. You know, many of us are approval addicts, and we spend our lives trying to gain that sense of approval from others. We had a young girl live with us in our earlier years of marriage, and she was a fantastic young woman, and uh, she loved our family to bits, and she served the so her socks off to bless us. She was always buying us gifts and buying the children gifts. And she'd been with us about a year, and suddenly the penny dropped. She is trying to earn our approval, not realizing that whether she ever bought another gift for our children, we would love her to bits. And that's how God is towards us. That's how God is towards us. So what is now true of us in the light of who God is? I want you to spend some time over the next few weeks thinking about these three areas. What is now true about us in the light of who God is? I've given you four little ideas of how to get you started on this, but this is, a, this is something to study, to reflect on, to meditate on, to pray into, to ask God, to speak to you about, because there'll be very specific areas that God wants to unlock for you personally. What is true about us in the area of authority that we've been given? What is true about us in the area of privilege that we live as his sons or daughters? And what is true about us in the area of our identity? Wow. The pressure is off. It's all about God. It's not about us. And our lives can move from got to, I've got to do this, duty, religious obligation, should, ought, and must, to get to, hey, I get to do this. This is how I get to live because I'm a son. I'm loved. He's great. He's glorious. I don't have to be in control. I get to share my faith because I'm not afraid of people because I now have this glorious God in my life. We, we need to move. The journey is from got to to get to and from do to be. In other words, gaining our sense of identity from what we do to living out of this new identity of who we are in the light of who God is, we get to do those good works. Okay. So it's time for the wise and foolish man exercise. What did the wise man who built his house on a rock do? He heard and he obeyed. He heard what God was saying and he did what God was telling him to do. So we're going to take just a couple of minutes now to fill in those sheets asking those two discipleship questions. What's God saying to me? What am I going to do about it? And uh, you've got those sheets. If you haven't, there are some spare ones around. If you need one, maybe just put your hand up. Someone will come and take one to you. Just take the last two minutes to stop for a moment. Close your eyes and stop and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? What do you want me to do about it? Just take a couple of minutes to answer those questions. Write your answers on the sheets.
How many people have been able to uh, write something down in response to those two questions? Great. Now, some of you need to take a moment longer. That's fine. But uh, we're going to wrap things up there and anticipate what God might continue to speak to us in the next session, which I'm, I'm really excited about this next session. I, I, I hope I will be able to transform your prayer life. Does that sound good? Okay, great.